Hello, everyone. Welcome to the webinar. This is a fantastic crowd of people. I have muted all of you. It's just easier to get the webinar flowing, but there is a text, text box available on the chat. So if you have any questions, please post it in the chat and we will get to it in the webinar. We'll also make space in the end for a few questions as well, and then I'll un unmute all of you then. Um, yeah, just welcome to the session and we hope you enjoy it. Yuan? Thanks. Um, I know. Yeah, welcome, everybody, on behalf of CASA. It's our first um, community conversation for the year. Our next one is scheduled for the 29th of June. And uh, it's a Wednesday. On that day, we're going to talk about preparing for meetings, especially around AGMs. So it's, um, we're going to have a lawyer in for the first couple of minutes just on the, on the legal side. And then for those who've been in the trenches to tell you a little bit about the uh, share a few tips of what worked and what doesn't work and how to host a successful AGM, seeing that we're going to go into the AGM season shortly. Then the next date to remember is the 18th of August. It's a Thursday. It's a course that we're going to uh, host at Stain City, and it's um, in-person attendance, and it's the M380, and it's all around uh, preparing for uh, legal court cases we're going to give you a, a short overview of how the legal system works in South Africa. We hope to have a judge or a retired judge there. We have, hope to have an advocate there and uh, one or two lawyers. And just a reminder that this course is for anybody. So uh, members, non-members, directors, uh, volunteers, residents, um, the, the more the merrier. There will be a re registration form shortly available and there will be a fee attached to it. There will be a differentiation for CASA members that will pay a little bit less and non-members. You're open to discuss uh, bulk fees for those of you who want to bring two, three, or four, or five from your community. And for those of you who carry the, the AMS um, and or the PCAM designation or the CMCA certification, we on track to register the courses for CAI so that you can earn some uh, continued education points. Uh, which we're looking forward to. So keep a lookout um, for the, on the Facebook page for that information. Then just a short update on the, on the courses. Uh, you can recall that I've mentioned before that uh, in negotiations with uh, Trani School for Business and Society, we have signed the, the license agreement so that they uh, certify the courses. I've done the first round for quality assurance. We're waiting for the Senate to approve it. And I've already started with uh, to localize the content of the M200 courses. That unfortunately does take a bit of time. And I hope to announce the courses with the TSB short, towards the end of the year. Uh, and our main way of communication will be through Facebook. And also for those of you on the database that received the notice uh, of today. If you've got any questions, drop it in the chat box. Um, I'll try and get you it around the courses and so forth. And that's it from me. I'm going to hand you over to, to Kita. Hello, everybody. A very warm welcome from all of us again. It's so lovely to all have you here with us today. Um, I'm going to be introducing our conversation host and three speakers for the day. Pinar Parpenfus will be leading us through the discussion of the maintenance conversation. We have Dries Boerter, Alfred O'Reilly and Dietrich Steenkamp, who will be our speakers for today and educating us on maintenance and estate maintenance um, for our needs and purposes. So please feel free to ask any questions you may have in the question box um, so that we can address it through the discussion as well as after. And yeah, enjoy the discussion. Over to you, Pinar. Kita, Johan, and Anay, thank you so much um, for the lovely introduction and giving us a heads up on what Case is doing nowadays. Um, very privileged to be part of this uh, webinar today. It will be my first, I'll be honest, but I'm very privileged because I think maintenance is a very, um, it's a very, very broad subject to talk about. And I think each and every different uh, estate, different community facility has got its own way of doing maintenance. So um, it will be lovely to hear from everyone over the, the country, Dietrich that sits very far, um, the other folks that sit around the corner to see what they are doing at these states and how these states are set up. 
So um, I've got a few conversation topics today for us, and I'm going to start with preventative maintenance versus corrective maintenance. So um, Alfred, uh, I don't know if you want to kick us off today. Um, how do you guys differentiate between doing preventative maintenance and how do you action corrective maintenance? Well, welcome everybody. Well, I think the, the very first thing is, is to try and determine which um, infrastructure you need to protect at all cost. Because mostly of uh, all our maintenance goes on to infrastructure. Um, that goes right through from your cabling, your water piping, all those type of things. And to make sure that when that does get installed, it, does, it has been done correctly and all the certificates has been issued um, from the suppliers right through to the contractors that did the installations of all those things. So I think that that is your, your main thing is, is to concentrate on, on all of that, especially when your state is still developing. Um, to ensure that the contractors does put in the highest quality of product. Um, and then from there on, obviously it's maintaining, um, you know, uh, like your sub, your, your mini subs, um, a lot of guys tend to neglect those things. This has to be serviced on a regular basis. Um, you know, so making sure your, your service programs runs smoothly and, and it does run on time and to obviously make sure that your budgeting does cover, cover those costs for those services. Um, Alfred, so if you, <clears throat> if you guys have corrective maintenance to be done on the state at like a mock, um, how do you guys action that? Have you got an internal team available to assist you with corrective maintenance? Yes. Um, what I've done is um, it's something that I brought from the previous state I worked for. Is, is to actually teach all the staff that works for me to do certain things. Um, and that helps a lot because, you know, where I have to now get a contractor in, I don't have to because most of the work we can do ourselves. It's only when it comes to your high-end electricity type of things, and obviously you need a certified electrician to do those works for you. But like your normal street lights, your electric fans, your water pipes, those type of things you can teach your staff to do, um, you know, and, and it's basically then just supervising them. So educating the staff helps a long, long, long way um, in helping you not to rent out uh, or to, to hire a contractor to come and do work for you. Now you can just do everything internally. So it's basically then just keep a, a record of, of stuff that needs attention and make sure you actually get the right staff to go and attend to that certain um, problem that you do have. Yes. Um, Dietrich, I want to ask you your inputs on preventative versus corrective maintenance at, um, at the Vine London. Yes, thank you very much. We know, <clears throat> we, we're a bit on the other end of the scale from Alfred and then we, we a much smaller estate um, and a much older one. We were one of the first estates in this Cape Town area. So where Alfred spoke to um, ensuring the developers and, and the contractors install the correct information there's a lot of information that goes missing over the years mm -hmm. and it's become very exploratory when things break and you need to to make a plan because you don't understand it and it's not according to the as bolts which the, the developers left you um i think all of us has been out at night starting generators and mm -hmm. um running around um so yeah preventative maintenance schedules are very important um it's it's actually something quite simple we also try to do as much as possible internally um yeah we've, we've actually have very little outsourced um so yeah Dries, i uh, just want to touch on you quickly before i give some feedback from stain city side um how do you guys do it at the coves I be not, thank you. Um, from our side as well, our state is now just over um, 16, 17 years old. So it's getting to that stage as well, where a lot of the stuff, with what, what I do is, for instance, I book it into seasonal stuff. For instance, in your winter months when it's more quiet, I would do my stormwater, remove the stormwater grids, get the leaves out, stuff like that, go through my sewer lines, ensure when my rain season comes, 
that all my manuals also are sealed that I never still want the problem. And then your stuff where you sub it out, where you get your contractors out, make sure that the stuff is prioritized. I mean, preventive maintenance, um, ensure the preservation of the common property. And this also secures the property values and also limits exposure, for example, injuries to residents and other guests as well. So it's important that you have a good record keeping as well with the essentials to make uh, regular maintenance happen and efficient. Yeah, I think record keeping is a very essential part to maintenance, um, especially in keeping manuals and pumps, um, those type of things that you can always revert back to to see if you can find faults and trace faults easier internally. Um, so yeah, it's Stain City, also large development, fairly new. Um, we, I think we're in the process of learn as we go in terms of our maintenance. We action preventative maintenance regarding a whole lot of, at this moment, check sheets. So we've got a small internal team and we go out and we do certain checks, weekly checks, monthly checks on our, how can I call it, critical items, the items that is of a larger um, fiscal value, if I can call it so much. So the checklists will be done weekly, monthly, and that's how we, that's one means of, of actioning a, a preventative maintenance. Corrective, we've got a lot of corrective maintenance at Stone City currently, um, due to the, if I can call it the, the personnel and infrastructure, the development of the personnel internally. So we are still fairly young when we come to our department heads, et cetera. So we're learning as we go, and we've got a few maintenance guys that actually action the corrective items. However, it's mostly day-to-day -day items. Um, but yeah, I think it's very important to focus on the preventative side of things, to, to try and find faults before they actually do happen. And then in order to have a redundancy when, when faults do actually happen, so you can keep the system or the facility running optimally. Yeah. Sorry, Pinar, if I can just add to you, Nate, um, a wise man told me once, if you haven't been through the state of touch the pump uh, in a day, then you haven't done your work, then you can't go. Um, you need to touch all of your pumps once a day to make sure that's, that you're on the game. Yeah. You're under the year, you're a wise man. <laughs> I, I uh, Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, uh, panel, I'm going to move over to, um, to my next uh, conversation topic, and I'm going to want to ask and I chat about outsourced versus internal. So if we can quickly touch on our three panel members to find out um, how many internal guys have you got on board, if you can give a brief indication as to what type of qualifications they have, and then how you try and manage them. I mean, how, many, how you manage your internal team on a daily basis. Uh, Dries, I wonder if you want to start. All right. Uh, so I think we one of the few, well, what I think one of the few um, HOAs that still got our in-house ground, ground staff. I'm sitting with 27 laborers and then two supervisors and then one maintenance manager. And then I've split them up because what I did is um, when I worked out my maintenance plan, I said, all right, I've got 27 people and I've got these different areas that I need to work with. And I'm sitting with 45 hours a week. So I need to work out what do they do exactly. And I rewrote the whole plan. And then, for instance, we've got our cleaners and stuff in our facilities that are split up that you can't do anything about. And then, obviously, your operators and then your um, EMP and then your maintenance team. So we've got a vast, we bit of a more of an agriculture farming society as well. So that gets outsourced once. And then we've got a forest as well. And then quite a good EMP. So I've dedicated um, half of my staff to the EMP that works on the environmental management plan. And then my operators, my operators, people that physically cut all the common areas, all the grass and stuff, except for the free, free old stands. And then obviously with your winter times, you are those people again available where you can do again, falling back to preventive maintenance again. So there is very little outsourced um, maintenance on your side. Correct, yeah. Little to none. Alfred, Little over to you. To none. Yes, uh, here at Mark, we only have a ground stop of five, um, which basically does everything. We do from fixing the roads, electrical fencing, stands clearing, fire breaks, all of that. So my guys is quite trained in, in doing everything. 
um, because I only have five guys, so we have to basically do everything. So therefore, we, we outsource very little, um, only in we have to basically determine on what we can do and what we can't do. So obviously, if we can't do something, then we'll outsource it, but that's very little. Um, so we try and keep everything um, that the staff does everything that needs to be done. Um, and it's a day-to-day -day basically. So you, you decide on the day literally, you know, if something comes up, who to send, who you can send to which, which area. Um, in, in the general, you, you've got your plan for the week, um, your workers plan for the week. So if, if everything runs smooth, you work through the week. But as soon as something pops up, you obviously send the right person to attend to the problem. Um, Alfred, I just want to interrupt you. We have a question here. I think it goes well with what you were saying. They were asking, do you guys use a software program to manage your maintenance tasks? Is there a software program and then you answer Excel? So I don't know, is there something else you guys are using or is it basically Excel and just keeping track of the schedule? Look, we, we've, we've recently got a program that we just started, but we haven't started using it yet. Um, but mainly, we, we basically, the um, homeowners and the security guards, we use the security guards, especially for street lights, because they they hear every night. So if they see there's a street light out, they report it, we fix it. So um, in general, it's basically just running the, the state entirely. Um, you know, if, if something pops up, somebody will, will, will tell, let you know, you know, something's happened and you determine, you know, is it something that can wait until tomorrow or it has to be fixed right immediately? Then if it has to, then obviously you just get <laughs> to it immediately. Um, so that will be, sorry, Anai, that's one of my points of discussion later on. But we can touch on that now. I just want to quickly jump over to Dietrich, if you don't mind, then we'll do that point next. Um, Dietrich, can you quickly um, give yes. us a heads up of your, your outsourced versus internal maintenance? Yeah, so we've got six permanent staff members and a landscaping manager. Uh, manager is. Um, most of the groundwork we all do internal. We, since we're quite an old estate in Cape Town, we still have the city tending to the street lights, um, Eskom still tends to the electrical infrastructure. So that makes our part a little bit easier to manage. Um, although building those relationships and keeping those relationships intact does take quite a bit of time as well. Um, and then the six staff has been basically divided into three teams um, and looking at where they excel. So we've got two guys that's basically just stuck in base because that's what they love and they know how to prune and prune correctly and um, an irrigation team at, and then the maintenance team that looks after the stormwater drainage and, and the roads and, and the more infrastructure side of it. Um, Dietrich, how big is uh, the Vinelanden? We've got 205 homes, but we a total of 70 hectares um so it's it's very low density it's lots lots and lots of ground to cover <laughs> yeah i think that touches on Alfred's point as well i think uh like a mark is just under 100 hectares am i right yes yeah we're 97 hectares yes so if i can give a quick point of view from stain city because i think we're the largest development um on this panel on this webinar so stain city is close to a thousand hectares so, oh, a lot of our big items, like example, landscaping is outsourced to a contractor. So the golf course and all landscaping areas gets outsourced to a contractor. They've got approximately between 120 and 160 staff per day on site. And that's all managed by one personnel on the management association that I oversee. So we've got one landscaping manager and he manages that entire fleet of, if I can call it a fleet of personnel, um, via the contractor. Same when it comes to security. Um, we've got security outsourced and they also do preventative maintenance and checking on electrical strands and wires. Um, IT, we've got our own internal IT team. They consist of a panel of about eight guys and they check cameras, fibers, those type of thing. And then for our day-to-day -day maintenance items, we've got uh, six guys, but they purely attend to street lights, cable faults, um, the, your normal road painting, um, lights in the offices, that type of thing. So we've got literally six guys physically focusing on building, focusing on building maintenance, 
and then the rest of our stuff is mostly outsourced. So that's a, a bit of information from my side from Stan City. Pinot? Yes, Johan. I just want to pick up on something that you said in terms of maintenance by security. Mm. Is that a <laughs> security guard that you use as first line maintenance on, on items? Uh, maybe just want to clarify that because I think it can help quite a okay. number of the participants in terms of, you know, are you structured? Yes. Thank you. So on our security, so we've got a, it's obviously broken down into a few sectors via the contractor. And then we've got a team within the security team that physically focuses the perimeter wall. So it's a fairly a large perimeter wall. And that's why we've, ex, um, we've outsourced it to the security team because they are 24 seven on site. So that team will patrol the 22 kilometer boundary wall um, 24 seven. They'll do checks, they'll check the electric stand wires to make sure that all the bobbins are correct, et cetera. And then should they not be able to to put a clamp or a wire up clamp onto the actual strand, then they'll outsource it and call the IT team, let's call it during working hours, operational hours to try and get it rectified. So we've got a first line of defense, if I can call it so much in terms of small maintenance to check the strands and the bobbins, make sure that the vegetation on our outside of the perimeter is clear and they don't go through the veget uh, strands. Um, but should it require major ticket items to be addressed where it needs to be restranded or the energizer needs to be looked at, then the IT team will get involved. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I'll, I think we can jump on to our next um, question that I asked about the maintenance software programs. Um, Dries, have you guys got anything in place in terms of software? Um, not really at this moment, and you know, it, 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 it's a question of we're at that stage where we where we are uh, moving over to more better technology at this stage. The current system works with radio links that is not always reliable. I mean, for now, for instance, I've been battling three days with my reservoir overflowing with the current old system that's running. Previously, I've worked with a program called SCADA. So SCADA is, is more a Rolls Royce and it's more a of a, a, um, it's a good management tool to use for you and to watch your service provider. But um, recently I've come over to a company that came and saw me, that's an upcoming company and they run in the same leagues basically, and it's called Smarta. So I wanna share it again next time because I'm busy with, with negotiations with them to put up a demo to see how it works. And that is a, a, a nice app that can show you your flow rates through your borals, if you guys still run borals, or movement on your, if to see if your pump is running and stopping. And it's very similar to a, a probe or a sensor that sits in your tanks and that runs from where your source comes from. And that talks to each other. And that is the normal GSM system. And uh, that's very affordable for especially smaller estates. Okay. Alfred, on your side, any software on your side to assist with the daily maintenance items? No, not, not on, on, on that. We, the only software that we're currently using is Globent, um, where the owners, if they detect a, a problem or see a problem, that they actually uh, put a, a thing on Globent to inform me of a problem. So in the morning, I get the notification, I can see the notification, and um, also I've got the app on my phone. So if it's urgent and I know it not, I have to go out to go and fix it. So um, that's basically the only form that we're using currently, but not a like an Excel type of sheet um, to, to help with that. Did Dietrich on your side? Yeah, no, we're not using any, any software. Um, I think it's pretty much like Dries also alluded earlier, you've, you've got to be out there and you've, you've got to see when things goes wrong. Um, and we're also using Glovin to as a reporting system, um, yeah, to keep our hands on it. So we at Stain City, we were a lot manual driven up until recent 2021, 2022. So we used to, you joked about Excel, we were thriving on Excel um, for a long time, doing check, please, check, search, check sheets, apologies, um, and then literally being out on the field day to day. So that uh, Globent that you guys refer to, we're currently writing an app for Stain City that the residents can get involved and report matters to get that problem sorted at the moment. However, we are at the moment fairly lot big in terms of our actual families. We've got between 800 and 1,000 families at the moment. So at the current moment, we're very hesitant in getting the residents involved. So 
Um, we are, <laughs> we believe that we are on top of things in terms of maintenance items. So we might get bogged down where we find that residents might report a bathroom fitting light that's out within their own house and dwelling. So we've hesitated to implement that system as of yet. However, we've recently procured a um, software program called My Buildings. So what this does is our entire asset list is lodged on this software program. And if a guy in the field, that's a maintenance guy, goes out and a fault is reported, he can log a photo, he can create a job card, sign it off, give a date, et cetera. And then that gives you a track record. So it also helps with fault finding. So if you find that with, if I can call it, let's say you've got a cable fault on a boundary wall, um, because we our system runs as a very quick FYI, we run a thousand volt cable that goes down into a tap down transformer and that gives you your um, 220 volt, 230 volts to the wall and then uh, up transformer via the energizer as well, obviously. So if you find that you've repaired a cable in the same location seven times in the last month, you need to know that there's something wrong. So that also helps with fault tracking. Um, and the other software program we also recently procured was a GIS type of system where you can update as built plans onto your, your actual app in your database. And then should you have replaced the cable within a tree line, whether it was ESCOM or internal, you can dot it down on the asphalt so that when you get there in the future and the cable have moved to another trench a meter to your right or left, that will be then updated. So in the future, you can open the correct trench. So that's the recent two softwares that we've procured. It's in um, the phase where we're still in adding assets and stuff, but we are currently busy utilizing those two software platforms. So that helps it's going to help and aid density quite a lot in the future. Uh, Pina, mm. uh, just on a, on, it's not software, but measuring devices. We, we're all used to, you know, normal uh, water meters, um, you know, the, the whatever is available. But when it comes to sewer effluent and, and things that's more difficult to, to, um, to measure, we, we've uh, <coughs> come out, uh, across um, some instrument uh, manufacturers, the one specifically is Vega, V-E-G-A, and they've got an array of, of instruments uh, that they use, and the one specifically for sewer, because in, in one of the states that I'm involved with, it's, it's quite a big thing. So uh, web-based, we can, we can on a four-hourly basis uh, track the, 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 the flow, uh, and it converts it back to volume. You can see you can, if you know how it works, the blockages and those kind of things. Yes. So why, yes, why yes. I mention it is, is that there's many, not just Vega, but many um, great instruments out there that can assist you that you don't need to run around the whole day, that you can, you know, web base access like Scardia and, and those things. You can access to get good detailed information J just to convert it back to Excel. Eh? And I say that tongue in cheek. So, it, um, yeah, there's some nice instruments out there that uh, can, can make our life easier. It's interesting you mentioned because we recently had a demand of two of our entities to measure this, the syringe, the influence. Yeah. So, and it's, it's, I mean, I can keep you busy out to measure sewer for, for hours, and it's a, it's a problem mm. through the flume and also kind of thing. But Vega, um, I must say, the Vega instrument, uh, it's, uh, it turned out to be quite good. So, um, um okay let's go to the next one sorry can i interrupt and then we do a few questions would that be fine yes okay so kids are asked is your preventative maintenance plan aligned with the reserve management plan and replacement plan um i don't know if Tris, offered or dietrich you guys want to answer one of that question stay it quickly we're still very much involved with the developer so we don't have a management maintenance plan um, like the normal HOA um, or managing agents have. Um, so we've got our own internal five, 10 year plan that we have, and then we assist and execute with the developer. So I can't un answer much on that, but I believe, I don't know, Dries offered or Dietrich, maybe you guys can. We've got a very, very basic replacement plan going. Um, what we have found in I mean, it's a swear word and they say management is special levy. So what we found work actually quite well in um, 
in the smaller items, I mean, like golf carts, et cetera, to so actually go into a lease agreement um, with a company. So you, you take that, the, the hills and the valleys out of the, the budgeting process. Um, but for obviously for your bigger ticket, ticket items like your, your fencing and your roads, et cetera, we, we do have a, a, a very basic structure and a specific fund, um, a, like a road reserve fund, which we've been contributing to towards. And um, yeah, I mean, I've been chatting to Johan as well. They also offer some, some reserve management studies, et cetera. Um, did Dries or Alfred, do you guys want to comment? No, no, look, we, at Lucker Mark, we also still much involved with the developers. Um, so we also don't really have any of that. Um, so we basically, to run, run along with the developers and they assist where they can and we assist where we can. Yeah, with us it's different. I mean, the state needs it as a fund policy in place for order for the state to be able to um, prevent the brain to maintenance plan to be efficient. But with us, we work it more towards a CapEx project because when that phase at the moment, we, we actually upgrading mm -hmm. um, a lot of our pump stations and stuff. So. A lot of that is actually now paying off, but we actually earmarked it for this financial year as a project. Uh, for instance, my um, the developer started with um, two sewer plants on the estate, and one of them is part of, of feeds a lot to from a sectional title. And now with this year, we're looking at the upgrade is actually making that more of a rise in main to the main pump station. And a lot of that stuff then internally is where we will replace the pumps get good telemetry systems running with it. And that should last you then with good pre preventative maintenance plan another 10 years. ESI with also with regular maintenance also be done on that. You know? Um, did you want to say yeah. something? Yeah, yeah Joan, yeah. There's just something that, that uh, uh, crossed my mind again, is, is especially for those guys who, who own their own sewer system. Their own sewer reticulation. Um, you know, we, we, we've got to measure it, you've got to clean it, and all those kind of things. And for, for a long time, I struggled to find somebody who can, who can actually inspect, you know, and uh, we found guys, and some of the other states use them now, where, where, where they can come in, they can put cameras in for long distances, they can, they can blast it, they can suck it, they can clean it out, they can do inline repairs, especially when your estate gets a bit older, that just assist you. Especially when the reticulation belongs to you, we don't have to dig up and, you know, to, um, to go through all these lengths to buy cameras and all those kind of things. That that makes your life easier, uh, you know, routes and uh, all those kind of things that over years go into to sewer lines. Um, some some lack of practical things out there that can assist um, everybody. Um, it it is. Uh, I'll, I'll put the name. I see somebody's looking for the name. I'll put it out there. Uh, we we know most Harry. And uh, Harry is like uh, on 911 for the estates at the moment. You know, when the sewer flows in the road, he comes and we come and sort your, your uh, sewer out with another is. Okay. So Thanks, I just want to add, add there what um, JK is saying. So the specific contractor as well. Um, we've earmarked in the last year that I've split up. So I call it um, mapping, plotting, and, 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 and cleaning. So what he basically does is we've never had asphalt plans. Well, we had sections of our state with um, asphalt plans, but what he did is he, he did the inspection, then he did the plotting and then the cleaning afterwards. So then afterwards, um, and I've actually split up my estate into two halves. So I've identified what is my worst areas after 17 years of this build out estate, and then started with that first as the phase one. And that's why I mentioned earlier, as a CapEx project, what I did now is this phase two is coming up after June because our year runs from end of June to beginning of July. And that is now what we have started with um, end of this month by phase two. And it's exactly that. You've got that video footage. It shows you exactly where your problems are. And you can also identify how serious your problems are. And like you once said, it's um, a matter of um, you just... Um, restructures or relines the pipe then in the inside and then obviously gives you the video footage afterwards as well and that has helped tremendously quite a lot that's good um dietrich i've got a question for you um for a state that you've said you've got about six guys on board um 
Uh, what type of maintenance plans and or schedules do you have in place um, for, I want to say, for the breakdown of significant items? So let's say you've got a critical item that you have. Do you have redundancy of that item, maybe in terms of stock? It's a, a big question. But what type <laughs> of plans and schedules have you got in place for that critical item um, to have it back up and running within a very short span, time span? Yes, um, I, let's say for instance security, we do have um, a basic a couple of switches. If a switch fails in the middle of the night, you've got patch leads on your fiber, etc. <clears throat> but I only carry stock of the, the plug and play items, so to speak. So if you need to get a professional in, I've got good relationships with my, my service providers. Um, and the majority of them do to have the, the, the critical supplies with them on hand. Um, yeah, but from, from my guys, like I said, it's, it's basically just the plug and play items that we deal with ourselves. I see. Um, Alfred, have you guys got any maintenance schedules and or plans in place for those critical items that can cause failures? Yes, um, I always um, carry a spare energizer for the electric bands because you never know when one can be hit. Um, yes. especially batteries, those we always keep on stock. So at any given moment, if the fence does give a problem, we can just swap uh, so, and then just claim back and just go and replace it or send it in for repairs. Um, with the previous estate um, where I worked at Mahles Park Golf Estate, um, what we've done there is they've had their own sewer plot. So um, luckily, yeah, I don't have that anymore. Um, but what we've done there is with the air blowers that you have, um, some guys don't know is that those air blowers does not come with um, grease nipples where you can grease your, 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 um, your, your, your pumps. And you can actually have them installed. So what we've done is with, with them is we've asked the suppliers to actually just install a grease nipple. So then you can actually grease those those, those pumps and it saves a lot because that now gets greased on a regular basis. So that does prolong the, the motors for a long time. So that's also something you guys can have a look at if you haven't done that yet. But use, use uh, the blowers. Dries, anything on your side? Hello, Dries. We've lost him. Um, Dietrich, I want to come back quickly. We're talking a lot about electric fence and energizers and switches on your cameras and your fiber and stuff. Um, do you guys have like a schedule of, let's say, restraining all of the electric wires? Having to open his shop 24-7 for us, that he can actually help us um, and open it whenever we need stock. With um, stuff... Critical stuff, for instance, generators, you've got to have a guy on call, like electrician or somebody now with load sharing as well. If your generator doesn't kick in 11 o'clock at night, it's not something you can leave till tomorrow. So you've got to have that speed dial on, on, on a guy that will be here within half an hour to have the problem resolved. I but see. it's critical to have those small little stuff, even if it costs you a bit more on hand, because it's um, you'll always be sorry the next day if you don't have them. Yes. Um, Dietrich, back on that question. Um, so do you guys have plans and schedules in place to argumentatively replace your electric strands on the perimeter wall? It, let's say every 10, 12, 15 years. I'm not sure. If you, have you got plans and um, schedules in place to replace the batteries for the energizers? Um, as far as the strands are going, unfortunately not. So we are basically reaching the end, end of life on our electrical fence or sections of it. Um, so we have started um, a replacement plan for the fence and saving towards it and hopefully we'll do the, the first section um, this coming financial year. Um, and then, yeah, batteries, we, we also carry stock. It's, mm. yeah. I think it touches on that previous note where the question was, um, does the maintenance plan action on the management plan for that 10 year period or whatever? And I think that's where this touches on where one needs to be very critical as to how you plan and schedule um, phasing out of life expectancies that, that reaches its life expectancy items, critical items. Yeah. Um, 
There's something that I can also say as um, regards to that. Uh, what we've done, um, we've actually started implementing it last year. A lot of the estates, um, when the new builder starts on site, charges a builder's levy or a builder's deposit. Now, the problem that I've always had with a builder's deposit is that I had to give a large portion of that money back or even everything. And the, the main idea of that was to make sure that you can claim damages back from that money so that if damages was caused. The biggest problem that we're all having and going to experience in a few years' time is our roads, which people tend to neglect because they, they just see it as a tall road. The problem is in a few years' time, that road will have to have serious maintenance on it. And where you're gonna get the money from at that time. So what we've done is we said, we scrapped, we also had our builder's deposit and we scrapped it and we call it now a builder's levy. So for as long as the owner builds, he pays a thousand rand builder's levy until the homeowner's assigned the house off is complete and he's got an occupation certificate. Now that money now can be transferred to a road fund, which now can start building up. So at that time, when you need to have that money, you've already got a large portion of it or some to start with to, 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 to spend on the roads. Um, that's good. Thanks, uh, Alfred. Um, Dries, can you maybe touch on what you believe is a few benefits of having an internal team that's got some capabilities of maybe electrician, a mechanic, that type of thing on hand? Yes. So um, with, with my guys, uh, Pinot, what I've got is some of them were general laborers, but they had some sense and they wanted to grow inside. So some sense of little bit of electric or mechanical background. And I've actually went and put them on a probation type of period for like three months and spent some time with them. And I've, I've believed that helped quite a lot as well. Instead of getting external people in, because sometimes it's just changing a breaker or something that will cost you money for an electrician to get out. But if you can train somebody to do it, even your maintenance manager, it helps quite a lot. So I'm really pro for that in our CR. Yeah. Dietrich, you mentioned that ESCOM, um, due to the fact that you're one of the oldest estates or the first estates on that part of the world down in Cape Town, um, you said that ESCOM still touches on and works maintenance on your streetlights. Um, is it sufficient? Um, do you guys struggle with that? Uh, yeah, so the city of Cape Town is looking off the streetlights. I actually had three trucks here today, um, usually following load shedding stuff goes a bit haywire. Yes. It, it is definitely sufficient. Um, we're getting now, for instance, with our streetlights to, to a phase where we would actually like to upgrade them just from the older fittings to newer fittings and um, that's something I've got to take up with them which makes it a little bit more difficult yeah. as well. Um, ESCOM has been very very slow. <laughs> I, I don't think or I don't wish it on anyone although it, it limits your expenses that they do maintenance but when there's breakdowns we've, we've had some big struggles. What we've been battling at Stain City with is, and it's all the more recent, one would believe it's due to load shedding, is we are having a lot of big HD cable faults from ESCOM site. Then the call obviously gets logged and ESCOM comes to site, but then they don't have plant, they don't have TLBs, they don't have cable, they don't have labor. And that becomes a major issue for us because I think in our specific scenario, we are very privileged to have the developer on site. So we do have plant and equipment on site to assist them. However, there's always a cost involved. So I think that's one thing that's a big maintenance, not so much a maintenance topic at the moment, but is where is estates going to go forward and do in order to get off the grid and how are you going to maintain those structures? Um, I think that's a very interesting topic that one can tackle in the future. Um, I don't know how's it going at our whisper down Alfred and Dries with ESCOM um, at the moment. Pinar, mm. Joanya, if I may, sometimes you don't want ESCOM to come on site for TLBs and to work on stuff. Huh? True. Because Very much they, true. They, they just rip up everything the same as council. Yes. You know, they, they come to repair water pipe and end up replacing data and electricity and all, 
all Correct. sorts of things. And I really say that tongue in cheek. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, something that, that crossed my desk uh, recently, where a developer is looking importing, um, and I mean, my, my information is very limited, Tesla batteries to take his estate totally off the grid. Now, what it will cost, can you take a whole estate? A brief discussion, yes, it's possible. So maybe in future, we will have Tesla batteries running our estates and, you know, as a go between between the ESCOM and the estate and can give you power for 10 or 12 hours. Just something interesting that crossed my desk over the last, yeah. over the last 30 days. Thanks. Um, Alfred, um, do you guys, you mentioned that you guys do maintenance on the mini subs yourself. Yes, well, the, the mini subs we have to unfortunately outsource. So there you basically, because that infrastructure belongs to us, so it's, it's not a municipal thing. So um, those things you have to obviously get qualified guys in to, 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 to come and service and that at a regular basis. Um, the, the trick, and, and, and I think the, the most important thing is, is to make sure that you, um, and it's just, and lucky for us, is with, with the developer involved, um, their main contractor is to have that good relationship with him because he can put you on to people to actually come and do the job. Um, because to try and get somebody that you don't know um, is always risky. Um, and especially in today's time. So it's always to, to, to try and get somebody that you, you know that has worked at another place before and you can trust them to come and do the job. How often do you guys do maintenance on the mini subs? Look, they, they say every year it should be serviced. Okay, there, there's a little bit of an argument. Some guys say five years, some guys say says a year. The main, main, most important thing is what I've, I've learned through this process is that at least have them come and inspect them every year. Because on the transformer, especially the older ones, um, unfortunately, I've got four of the older ones um, that still runs with the oil. Those you can actually see when they start leaking. So if you have a regular inspection, you can actually start seeing where they leak. And then as soon as they leak, then obviously you need to attend to it sure that the oil level stays up to, to the safest level. Uh, there is the newer ones now that works with gas. Those ones, um, they say, it doesn't need that frequent servicing and, and checking. Dietrich, do you in uh, Cape Town service your own mini subs? No, not at all. That's all up to Eskom at this stage. I see. Same on Stain City at the moment. Ours is also not owned by Stain City. Dries, yours? Um, yes, Alfred, I'll share a guy's number with you that's been doing ours every year, religiously, regularly, every year. So I believe and you need to do that. You need to, obviously, we've got um, 90 small kiosks and nine mini subs. So once a year, I've got the company, they come out regularly, they need to find your hotspots on your small kiosks, they go through and they clean it, they take your oil on your mini subs. But that is something you need to um, ensure that happens once a year. I mean, there's nothing as bad as um, being um, not well maintained and then finding out later that it should have been done on a more regular basis. I see. Now, um, a very interesting topic that I want to chat to you about is road demarcation, maintenance thereof. Um, at Stain City, it's fairly new. Our roads are currently between eight and 10 years old. We do have a lot of construction vehicles on the roads. So we now at that critical time where we need to start doing maintenance on our redemocation. And we're currently looking into it, um, procuring maybe a machine internal, having two guys on that during the winter months, not for Dietrich in the winter months. Um, right. But how does the, um, how Dietrich, do you do a lot of road demarcation? Is there demarcation on your roads? Yes, there is. So we, I try to do it. Um, only once a year, but especially on the paved sections of the road, you've got to do it more. Um, and I'm actually very fortunate with a, a contractor in the local community that comes in with his team and do it for us. The really um, value for money proposition. Um, yeah, so like mostly once a year, and I'll, I'll try and do it just before the Christmas period when everyone's um, coming back to their state and, and everyone's families are visiting. And that's outsourced, so you budget yes. for that once a year. Yes, that's correct. I see. Alfred, on your side? 
Yes, ours is also outsourced. Um, just a, a hot tip, if you, if you can have a look and make sure that when you have it outsourced, that you, you, you have to make sure that they, um, the amount of paint that they actually put on the tar. Um, we've had it where we outsourced it, we got some quotes, we decided to use this one guy, got, got highly recommended. And two, three months down the line, the paint started coming off. So then they started blaming all sorts of things. And um, you could notice that the paint that they've actually painted on the road is, is, is very thin. So you have to make sure that you, you have a certain thickness that you do specify to say that this is the thickness of paint that has to come onto the road. So that those guys understand it and you can actually take them on when it does, it does not happen because it, it does become a problem and they always blame some form of chemical or something and eventually the guy had to come back and he actually did come and repaint it. But, you know, um, it, and it's something also what Johan mentioned in one of his courses is that um, now is the right time is to do it in the winter time when it's not a lot of rain. Um, going into the summer, late in the summer, it's, it's, it's causing too much, much problems with all the rain and so on. Um, because rain does play a large role on, on the paint um, that's on the road. So winter time is definitely the best time to do it. Alfred, you now keep on mentioning the, the thickness of the paint and stuff. Do you personally in and do a foam thickness density test, uh, a FDT? Or do you take the word of the contractor that it's at the thickness that it's required? You see, it's something we didn't know um, at the time. Um, you know, it's something I wish I knew. Um, you know, for me, it was the guys coming up and paint the roads. It's like I said, he came highly recommended. He's done a few other estates just to find out afterwards that, you know, there's a, a, a certain standard and that standard, you had to have that uh, thickness on, on, on your paint. Um, so this wasn't anything that we could fall back onto. Johan, can I quickly ask you a question? You were for a very long time managing Pekinwood. Um, was that also a vast magnitude of the estate that's also now developed? Was that outsourced or was it internal done? Uh, for, for me, the big thing is to, I'm going to answer it just the roundabout way. It depends on the surface. If it's either uh, tar or um, bricks, tar far easier because you can put the little spray gun on there. The bricks not because the, the, you know, the, the nozzle, the distance differ. But we did that internally in winter time. And believe it or not, we used the cheapest paint because it lasts yeah. the same time as the, as the most expensive paint because on bricks. Bricks. Yeah. And I'm talking tar. At, yeah. at Lanceria, we, we outsource it to, a, and there's various companies, road marking companies, they come in there, those guys know their job, they've got different colors of paint, but the bricks, I found that uh, winter, cheapest paint, and then maybe in budget, you can paint it twice. First yeah. rain comes, it starts to splinter off, and, and it looks yeah. like you haven't painted your roads for a year. And the other thing, just as a, if you do it in-house, and you do it in winter time, it gets hot out there. So your team that's out there in the, in the summertime, you know, in the sun, um, the, the heat coming from the road, winter for us being to be uh, uh, the best. On the roads at Lanceria, tar roads, uh, we just resurfaced it through collage. Uh, they did a great job. And we went out on tender, cheapest guys came and painted the roads. And it took us two or three days, but it was outsourced. Fairly cheap, but it's tar, big difference. Thank you. Uh, Thanks, Johan, for giving that input. Um, guys, I think we're nearing the end of this webinar. Um, Dries, is there something in terms of advice or maybe something you'd like to share in terms of maintenance? Um, on maintenance, I just want to add quickly on to that as well, what um, what's just mentioned. So what we do is we've got eight and a half kilometers of tar surface. So what we normally do is I, I split it up into four. Then I, every year I do about two kilometers of road rejuvenation. So what it is, is a product that they actually come and paint on. It's a two millimeter and it actually gives you a longer longevity on your roads as well. But I would also agree, I do all the paint work I do in-house um, and I use PDA. I just do it more often. That's it. And it, it costs you much cheaper, yeah. Um, but also, it's a good tip on maintenance as well. It's just my last thought of it. If it's not broken, uh, don't try and fix it. <laughs> yeah, all right. <laughs> Alfred, anything, advice maybe from your side or key points on maintenance? 
Well, I think um, mostly, you know, especially if you've got machines running all day, um, every day, make sure you, you service them on a regular basis. Uh, don't wait until it breaks before you want to try and, and, and fix it. Then, then it's too late. Um, so just regular service on your machinery, should, they should last. Dietrich, advice from Cape Town. Document everything. When you move a cable, it's been touched touch on a couple of times, is when you move a cable, when you move a pipe, document it. Don't, don't let the next guy in the lurch because, yeah, we've been discovering stuff for five years and I still don't know where everything is. Very much true at Stain City as well. Even, even our as bolts are sometimes far off. So um, I think it's a very crucial point there to document as to where exactly what is, um, we touched earlier, I think it's very important to have a track record of what's been fixed, how many times it's been fixed. Um, and I think it's also crucial from our point of view. Um, I've learned a lot. If you if you keep your guys motivated, the internal maintenance team and the Oaks, you put in incentives here and there, they'll always walk the extra mile. So I think that's a very key point on my side that I've noticed. Um, so there's a lot of ways in doing it, but just keep the guys happy and, and they'll walk the extra mile. Um, Yuan, your side experience-wise, anything that you can give it of advice? Um, I think I've said enough for one day. You know, so <laughs> the wise man. Uh, remember to touch the pumps, huh? Yeah, we'll be <laughs> what the wise man said. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, yeah. guys. What a what an awesome uh, webinar. I, I think these things um, regularly, internationally, locally, Wow, thank you, Pinar, to you and to Dries and to Didrik and to Alfred. Awesome. Remember the 29th? Uh, for those of you who've got some stories to tell about AGMs, let us know, DM me, so we can put you on the panel. And this is, we're going to do more of these as we go on. And it's really to, to give you extra tools and to, to assist you to be better at your job. That's, that's what we, um, we're here to, to do for you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Sure. I've made it possible for you to unmute yourself. So if you do have another question to ask, please feel free to do that now. Otherwise, you can leave the session uh, when you're ready. Thank you for, for being here. I, have a good day. I, there was a question on the 10-year maintenance plan that, that I can maybe answer if, if, if people want to stay behind uh, for HOAs. Um, according to my information, there's nothing in the Companies Act that uh, forces you to have a 10-year maintenance plan. But it's the right thing to do to have a reserve study or a reserve fund. It's more to do with uh, sectional title on a 10-year maintenance.